Good evening. My name is Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's program manager. On behalf of the rest of the staff at Town Hall, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation celebrating the 51st annual Earth Day with the Black Farmers Collective as a part of our science series. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for appearing to help make that possible. It's our honor to highlight the Black Farmers Collective this evening, and we are so grateful to them for bringing this program to us. The Black Farmers Collective is a group of urban food system activists dedicated to providing opportunities to improve the health of the Black community through all aspects of the food system. We encourage you to consider supporting their work in our region tonight by using the link in the chat to donate. Tonight's program will be about an hour and a half with a mix of individual presentation, conversation, and Q&A. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video player, so please submit those at any time. You can also text questions to 206-504-2857, as noted in the chat. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arnold Matolsky Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Norcliffe Foundation, Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching. And now I'd like to introduce Catherine, Cameron Steinbeck, Steinbeck, who will tell us a bit more about tonight's program. Cameron Steinbeck is the Black Farmers Collective Board Secretary. Originally from the Bay Area, Cameron came to Seattle to earn his Master's of Education in Urban Environmental Education. Through conversation and volunteering at Yes Farm, he was invited to join the board of the newly organized Black Farmers Collective. As a part of the board, Cameron is involved in strategic visioning and supporting the development of future education projects for the collective. He is also participating in a practicum for sustaining agriculture in hope of starting his own organic farm business. Please join me in welcoming Cameron Steinbeck. Thank you very much, Megan, as well as Town Hall Seattle, and welcome to all of our guests tonight uh, for our uh, presentation uh, of the Black Farmers Collective and our, our panelists and guests. Um, I'll begin with a, a brief uh, history and summary of the Black Farmers Collective, and I'll share, uh, share my screen with you all during this time as well. Now, um, the Black Farmers Collective um, is credited with starting with uh, Raymond Williams. Um, he's a science teacher uh, who's lived in the Seattle area for some time, and he's used gardens as a tool for teaching for, for a long time as well. He's built relationships with educators uh, and growers across Seattle and the region, and through that work, including more and more people involved with uh, working for food justice. Now, the Black Farmers Collective initiated about seven, uh, six years ago, um, during which time a request for proposals came out uh, for a site uh, at Yesler Terrace adjacent to I-5. Through dedication and many conversations and a vision for the future, uh, Yes Farm was created. Now, the Black Farmers Collective is comprised of um, about uh, uh, a few different growing spaces. Uh, yes Farm, as I mentioned, Yes Sir Terrace, uh, Small Axe Farm in Woodenville, Washington, and Brown Egg Garden at the Africa Town Center for Education and Innovation. We also engage in many partnerships with uh, farmers and growers throughout Seattle and the Puget Sound region, including Nurturing, nurturing Roots, um, um, Percussion Farms, and many organizations working for food justice throughout King County. Now for tonight's program, um, we're really excited to have a few of our members of the Black Farmers Collective and the people working within our organization, uh, as well as a, a fantastic guest. So I'll share with you the, the vision that we have, our mission, and I'll introduce our first panelist. 
um, our vision for the organization here is envisioning a, a future of black liberation through food sovereignty in spaces built on cooperation and interconnectedness with the environment and community where our knowledge and creativity are boundless. Our mission is to build a black led food system by developing a cooperative network of food system actors, acquiring and stewarding land, facilitating food system education and creating a space for black liberation in healing and enjoy. Now, I'm gonna introduce a, um, our first panelist tonight. Um, our first panelist is uh, Hannah Wilson, our farm manager at Yes Farm. Um, Hannah is the farm manager at Yes Farm. Um, it's, an, it's an urban farm initiative of the Black Farms Collective. Um, at the farm, uh, they focus on community building, educational programming, and growing food that centers healing and liberation of people of color and uplifts Black leadership. Anna also serves as a co-chair for both the Seattle Disability Commission and the Environmental Justice Committee as part, of their, as part of their efforts to move systems change on the ground and on governmental policy levels. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Hannah, who's gonna be leading our first uh, conversation topic tonight. Hannah. Thank you, Cameron. Hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here for Black Earth Day. I hope you've all been able to enjoy the sun this week. I'm really grateful to share all I've been able to build and grow and bring to life with the Black Farmers Collective in the past year and a half. And I'm grateful for Town Hall for providing us the platform to tell our stories tonight. So again, my name is Hannah Wilson. I use she and they pronouns. And I'm currently the farm manager at Yes Farm and have been working on the space with the collective since the beginning of last year in 2020. I'm going to share the ways my lived experience has informed the way I approach my work at the farm and as an organizer in the Seattle community. The way I walk the world as a queer, deaf, mixed race black person has really given me so many tools for dreaming and building towards black liberation and food sovereignty. So a little bit more about myself and how I got to Yes Farm. I grew up in Northern California in the Bay Area and moved here to Seattle six years ago to study environmental science at UW. While growing up, I hadn't seen celebrated role models for black leaders in environmental work or out enjoying natural spaces as much while hiking, camping, all those things. I didn't see queer or disabled leaders in these spaces either. Because of that, I never really saw myself going into the environmental field or farming. Even when I was really engaged and excelling in my environmental science classes, I didn't see where I could play a role specifically as a leader. Everywhere I looked, it was still just white, able-bodied peers, largely white men who were celebrated leaders. When I got to college, I took a class outside of my major called Geographies of Environmental Justice, and things began to click a little bit more. I began to truly understand the systems that have impacted generations of people of color in this country, especially Black and Indigenous folks. I began to see how the ways I've been treated and harmed by society was reflected in these systems. I began to see how the complicated intersections of my own identity was reflected in the ways that environmental justice leaders talked about the compounding factors that leads to huge inequities in environmental health in this country with race being the number one factor determining those things. How frontline communities, communities impacted by climate change first and hardest are largely made up of communities of color. And also how just 0.52% of farmland is owned by black farmers today when there used to be nearly a million black farmers in the US in 1920. They had their land ripped away from them just as the land had been ripped away from indigenous people many years before when colonizers arrived. From then on, I was really committed to making environmental justice my life's work. That moment was also a pivotal moment in beginning to celebrate myself and my healing and what it would mean for me to show up as a leader. It uncovered many possibilities for the futures I could imagine for the world because I also began to learn all the ways BIPOC communities have been out here using their creative genius, ancestral knowledge, and collective power to steward the land and create solutions and build towards a better future. I began to seek out spaces with leaders of color and saw myself. I saw these leaders talking about disability justice 
and how those folks didn't have access to green spaces and food either and would be harmed first by climate change. I, I talked to people who talked about queer and trans people of color and their liberation and how that was tied to climate change. I talked to folks about how abolition and healing were crucial to the revolution and how we would be able to find a better future, a future that is liberated and sustainable and how all of those things were incredibly intersectional and required all of us to undo a lot of things. So now I'll share a little bit more about how all of this ties into Yes Farm and the Black Farmers Collective. I spent a lot of time working for various white-led environmental nonprofits around the city and doing field work for forestry labs. And I was hired to join the team at Yes Farm to build capacity for Black Farmers Collective, which was a, a new and growing organization. My goals were to continue the director raised long history of collaborating with schools and organizations across the city to get youth and their families engaged in growing their own food for healthier communities, especially highlighting the ways that redlining, gentrification, and environmental racism had huge impacts on the Black community's health. This includes barriers to access to green spaces and fresh food, both of which are key to the health of one's mind, body, and spirit. Learning from Ray and his vision has truly been one of the biggest gifts. And so now I'm going to share my screen so that y'all can just see this beautiful place. My life. Um, so this is Yes Farm. Uh, you can see that it is hugged on all sides by the freeway. We have a little Harborview Hospital. We have housing projects next door and the International District. We're truly in the center of a lot of things. Um, next, I'll share some of the goals of the Black Farmers Collective because I think this has really informed the way that I moved through doing this work and has been incredibly inspiring to make sure that we are in alignment with our values at all times. So the main things are providing food, education, and community building to the neighborhood and surrounding communities. We want to improve community health. We want to uplift and generate Black leadership. We want to support new BIPOC farmers. We want to facilitate the sharing of cultural traditions and spaces. We want to make sure that folks have access to land and growing space. We wanna make sure that when we do land stewardship that we're thinking of uh, our original stewards and continuing stewards of the land, the indigenous folks, and thinking about how we can restore pollinator habitat and healthy ecosystems. We want to finally make sure that we are striving for food justice and food sovereignty. Next, you'll see some photos of what the farm looked like when I arrived um, in January 2020. There had already been a lot of work done building a greenhouse and growing some food and some raised beds. However, over the course of the year, I've been able to put in a lot of work with the community and really transform the space into something really beautiful. Um, here you can see we have a large amount of growing space right on the left side. And then beyond that, we have a community garden space. Soon we'll have a herbal medicine garden installed this spring with many uh, cultures represented in that garden. We also have a greenhouse that's used as a teaching garden where different programs and educators can use the space for growing food and just teaching classes in general. We also have a shipping container and an outdoor classroom. That's been a great place for gathering and teaching and, and making sure we have all of our supplies on site. There's some more pictures. And here you can see some of our uh, evidence of our education and, and our teaching some seed saving. And all of this work is really about community building and creating those gathering spaces and learning circles and making sure that we're not just using Western ways of knowing when we teach these things. And when we do this work, we're also thinking about the ways that we can make it safe and accessible for many folks to be involved. And that looks like inviting folks down and welcoming them and celebrating them, not just accepting or tolerating our differences. 
And in this work, I've seen that this creates community and creates the representation that I wish I'd been able to see as a kid. We've been able to grow a lot of food and partner with a lot of folks. And we also have been able to show up at different garden spaces across the city so that we can bring the farm to other folks as well. This is an acknowledgement of all the barriers there are to growing your own food um, and making sure that folks know that they are wanted and, and desired in this space. And we also make sure that in this work that we're incorporating art and culture and education, making sure we're thinking about land stewardship and what that looks like making sure that not only are we teaching about growing food, but we're talking about the science behind growing food and the environment, and also giving people skills such as building and carpentry. This is an example of the ways that we've been able to share cultural tradition by celebrating Dia de los Muertos and having a land blessing and altar at the farm. These are some of our gardeners at the farm. Another thing that we've been doing is making sure we're working with organizers and leaders across the community to make sure that we show up to community events and show folks what we are doing and give them an opportunity to express themselves in it. So here we brought some planter boxes and we were able to show folks ways to paint the planter boxes and take them home and have some empowerment in that. And finally, our, our biggest thing, or not our biggest thing, but one of our big things is making sure that we're growing food for those who don't have access to it and making sure that the food gets in the hands of people of color. The ways that I do this intentionally are by making sure that this food is purchased by mutual aid groups and BIPOC owned businesses. This also facilitates economic development and empowers folks to strive towards more self-determination. In this work, we've also worked with other urban Black farmers who are looking to grow more food and have more space in an urban environment. I'll continue showing some photos, but really, I want the farm to be a small model of what Black liberation and food sovereignty can look like. If we can dream and grow food and do so much more on a freeway right of way, people can see how they can take this into their own communities and be a part of facilitating their own interconnected and radical food system. Here are some other resources for connecting to Black-led farms in Seattle. Of course, we have Small Axe, Nurturing Roots, Black Star Farmers, Percussion Farms, Clean Greens, Farm and Market. And then if, for folks who are wanting to go even further, there's a reparations map. That's a great resource for finding other Black farms to donate to and support. And this is a list of Black farms that is continuing, continuing to build and grow in Washington. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I cannot wait to continue building out Yes Farm to be more and more in alignment with BIPOC ancestral growing practices, being a space for Black liberation, and for Black folks to be celebrated and cherished in their community. And, and I hope in the future that I can see ways that we can help facilitate more and more land for Black farmers and make sure that Black farmers are also able to keep their land. I also hope to continue my own healing, loving the land and loving Black people and all the folks in my community and continue learning always. Um, thank you so much. That's it for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah, for giving us lead off. Um, if you'll join me, you know, from wherever you are, um, just give a hand clap of appreciation or snap your fingers or do a little dance for where you're at uh, for, for Hannah and sharing her, her vision and inspiration and work um, with the Black Farms Collective at Yes Farm. Um, before we head to our, our next speaker, who will be uh, Devon, um, I want to just acknowledge where we are starting to get questions in from our audience. So thank you so much, um, Ben and Thomas, uh, for, for um, putting your questions out there. Um, some of our vision for Black, well, Ben asked, what is our vision for Black liberation? Um, and Thomas asked, can we talk about some of the 
uh, black owned farms operating in King County. So thank you for sending those ones in. Uh, we'll see as those questions may get answered as uh, more of our speakers uh, begin to, to share more of their work. Um, we're definitely gonna get into some of that question and answer. So feel free everyone, continue to send those questions in. Uh, we are receiving them and we'll be uh, addressing those uh, throughout the evening. So thank you so much. Um, without further uh, ado, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Um, Devon, I'm going to get my um, chair back up real quick uh, as I introduce our next speaker. All right. So introducing Devon as our farm specialist at Yes Farm. Um, Devon was born, uh, raised in Chicago, Illinois, um, and his experience in past has, has been living in places where corner stores were the only uh, neighborhood food source. Uh, now, devoid of uh, fresh produce, those corner stores simply primarily uh, provide high uh, highly processed junk food, contributing to uh, many diet-related diseases in the Black community. Devon sees the lack of uh, grocery stores, oh, yeah, no, no good, uh, as the lack of grocery stores uh, or food deserts as a significant contributing factor to a different kind of pandemic that's been afflicting Black communities for generations. Urban farming is the solution Devon is inspired to pursue and promote throughout the communities of Seattle and Tacoma. Um, working with the Black Farmers Collective, Devon is part of an effort to share skills of growing your own food and the benefits of healthy eating. Um, through the Black Farmers Collective, he's really happy about uh, the opportunities to participate in the quest for food justice and liberation for our communities. Um, and I'll hand it over to Devon uh, to speak more about uh, his, his life and experience and uh, solutions for the future. Hand it over to Devon. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me out. Appreciate it. Well, sorry, I lost my thought. As Cameron was saying, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and in my neighborhood, there is no, there is no grocery stores. There are only food deserts, and those grocery, you know, those corner stores, they don't sell the best of foods. It's all processed garbage, if you ask me. And you know, speaking of that, you have one would think, if there is nothing but bad food in the neighborhood all the time, how does one think? How does one make the right decisions without you know being affected like that? The answer is you can't make no decisions. You can't make no good decisions when you don't have no good food in your body. The body can't nourish itself. It can't provide the proper nutrients to the brain and everything like that. So therefore you're, fault, you're, you're faced to make bad decisions, unfortunately. <sighs> Working with the Black Farmers Collective, we've strived to teach, we strive to teach our people the benefits of healthy, eat, of healthy eating. So this way they can understand and then we can teach them how to grow better. We can, I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake. Working with the Black Farmers Collective, we strive to teach our people the benefits of healthy eating. So this way they can farm and grow crops themselves. Over 70% of diseases are diet related. And since there are no grocery stores in my community or anything like that, that's a pandemic to me. And I've seen it firsthand how people can be affected by that, clogged arteries, diabetes, amputation by foot because, you know, because of diabetes and everything like that. So this, this is a little personal for me. Before I worked with the Black Farmers Collective, I used to run a business and I used to teach finance to my family members. But now that I work with the Black Farmers Collective, I still get to teach financial literacy to our people on the farm. Before that, I also used to do security. So I also like to make sure that when I'm on the farm that security is the number one priority for all our staff and all our volunteers. Ever since I've been at the, ever since I've been working at Yes Farm, I've been learning a lot of important things like aquaponics, building flower beds, mixing soil, and the importance of the importance of the role that bees play on the farm. I never liked insects at first, but now that I work on a farm, I know they play an important part and I really appreciate them. And I know a lot more about soil now, thanks to Cameron, of course. The best part about working with the Farmers Collective is after when you get done putting in all that work, when it's time to go home, you get to turn back and you get to see all the things you built. And to me, that's very beautiful. And to me, that's also a form of rehabilitation. 
biggest lesson that I've learned from working with the Black Farmers Collective is patience. And also don't be afraid to try new things. You may get nervous, but that's okay. Just give it a try and also have fun. I'm very thankful for the Black Farmers Collective for teaching me all these things because now that I know more than what I knew before, I'm more confident in myself and I'm also more confident that I could guide others and I could teach others too. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much, Devon, for sharing a bit of your story and experience with Yes Farm. I can echo so many of those uh, those feelings and experiences, um, whether you got dirt under your nails, uh, if your back hurts a little bit, if you're, you know, using incorrect posture, um, the work is, is worth it and it's so important. Um, We've got a little bit of time before I was going to move uh, to our next presenter, Nar. I just wanted to, I think it's important to uh, address a couple of those questions that uh, that were brought up in the chat earlier on. Um, one of the first ones, you know, what is uh, your vision for, for Black liberation? And, you know, we've had lots of different conversations within our collective. Um, there are, there's many scholarly uh, conversations in academia about what Black liberation looks like. There's conversations that happen on the street corner about what is Black liberation that's been going on for generations. Um, when we're talking about Black liberation, um, we are situating that um, with the, um, with the, with the knowledge and understanding that um, food justice recognizes the food system as a you know, racial project that problematizes and um, uh, the, the influence of race and class on the production, distribution and consumption of food. Um, so liberation is really the, the, the removal or, or freedom or absence of the oppression that exists when you have disparate food systems and disparate asset access to food and disparate access to land. So that's just one aspect of um, of, uh, of Black liberation that, that we see that we are operating with uh, through the Black Farmers Collective and the many niches that we have with us through uh, education, through uh, accessing and stewarding land, um, and, and just building that network so that we can have more of those healthy grocers, Black-led, Black-owned healthy grocers right in the neighborhoods that they're most needed. Um, as a Devon experience, as, as we've all maybe seen in our, our own locales um, here in Seattle, where I'm from in the Bay Area. This is a problem that is not unique to any one part of the United States or any one part of the world. So those are the kind of things that we're talking about. We're talking about black liberation and food justice. Um, in terms of getting access to our events um, and information that we're putting out there, um, you're welcome to visit the blackfarmerscollective.com um, or visit us on social media, on Instagram or Facebook. And that's where we're usually posting different uh, ways that we are coming together for different events. Um, we're promoting lots of other black farmers and black food justice organizations uh, right here in Seattle. And as we know, the internet and social media, there's rabbit holes that go all across the country. So whether you're in Seattle, Tacoma, the Bay Area, Chicago, New York, New Orleans, uh, there is a Black-led food justice system, uh, probably not too far from where you are. So thank you for those questions. Please uh, keep them coming. Um, with that, I will introduce our next presenter, um, Nar, and I will bring this up real quick. <laughs> All right. Here we are. All right. NAR, um, our farm manager at Brown Aid Gardens at the Africa Town Center for Education and Innovation, is a trans feminine, uh, -feminine non-binary individual who understands their work with the land and community as a means towards healing ourselves and transformative justice within communities. NAR is actively constructing community garden beds for the Brown Aid Garden to increase space for the community to learn and grow. City animals are one of the focuses at the garden, specifically caring for and educating others about chickens and bees. Uh, through Sunday service work parties at Brown Egg, NAR uses a model of incorporating in-person and online engagement that provides a platform for people to learn about farming, ecology, and justice. A cornerstone of this work is uplifting stories sourced from BIPOC knowledge and created for, for, for a BIPOC audience. 
Sharing the wealth of knowledge from these endeavors is just one way NAR works with, food, works with the food justice movement that we sustain with Seattle Black, Indigenous, and People of Color communities and organizations. With that, let's all welcome NAR for their presentation. Thank you, Cameron, and thank you, uh, Tan Ha, for having me here today. Hello, everybody. Um, I am managing and maintaining the uh, Barnett Gardens at Africa Town, like Cameron has said, and it has been a really fun and wild ride so far. Um, I've never had the opportunity to take on a project like that before, and I really have to thank the Black Farmers Collective for that. Um, I am going to speak a little bit about myself, my upbringing, and identity today. Um, I grew up in an equatorial desert, so I often found myself scratching my head, um, wondering how I got involved with food and farming at all. Uh, to be a farmer in Abu Dhabi, where I am from, means you raise goats or cattle. It doesn't expand too far far from that. So I had no concept of growing food that existed outside of a grocery store. Um, my family actually made fun of me a lot. When I moved to America, I started working in a greenhouse and I aspired to become a farmer. Um, but it wasn't something I could take home where I was expected to live. I was raised Muslim in a majority Muslim society. And I was openly queer as a teenager I am transgender and quickly became erased, whether that was by others or by myself. I didn't find a lot of space for myself because I lived in a gendered society. Most spaces, most activities were segregated by the binary. Um, at a certain age, I wasn't allowed into spaces with women. So I struggled to fit in. I struggled to find where I belonged and moved to Chicago when I was 17 years old. Um, and I continued to struggle with that sense of belonging, um, but I had the opportunity to work towards who I am now. Being trans and wanting to work in an environmental field is difficult. Being trans and wanting to exist in any environment is rough. Um, I still face that same erasure from others and from myself and don't even know I'm doing it half of the time. Um, and similarly, being black and working in the environmental field is difficult. Being black, being brown and existing, it's rough, especially in America, which came as a cultural shock to me, um, learning that my skin color was holding me back in society. Um, and I think I was prepared to take on that weight in the wrong ways. I was holding myself back. But in my early 20s, I began volunteering in a South Side Chicago urban farm and it was everything to me. It fed me first and foremost, kept me alive in that way. And although I struggled with a language barrier with the Spanish speaking community farmers, I felt that they were taking care of me, seeing me, and I was able to give that back to them. And it wasn't something I'd felt before. It was, it was healing. Um, it didn't matter how I presented. It didn't matter what skin tone I had. Um, and so I became an intern with their group called Enlace and did data entry for their violence prevention program um, and taught English in their community gardens. Um, and from there, I just knew this is the type of work I wanted to continue to do um, where I could establish a sense of belonging, not only to the earth, but to myself. Um, my identity plays a strong role in who I want to be as a farmer. I want to process and heal from oppression and internalized stigma. I want to process and heal from having to uproot myself where home was supposed to hold me. I want to be safe. And I think that is what we strive for as black farmers. What I found in my journey is that food will always be there to hold us. Um, empowerment and confidence 
these are almost like battles I thought I needed to conquer. Um, needing to advocate for my existence is important to me as a trans person of color, um, especially working in cis white male dominated fields. Um, it's difficult to navigate um, as an environmental professional. Um, advocating for myself was not always heard. Um, it was not always enough. And it often led to discomfort or fear or conflict. conflict. And I would panic, conceal myself to a degree um, and just hoping to learn the skills that I could take someday to my own community. And there I was again, scratching my head, thinking what, what is my community exactly? How do I, how do I tap into that? Um, feeling very alone. Um, Finding the Black Farmers Collective has been a treasure to me. It's allowed me to envision what creating my own space to grow can look like. Um, how important it is to feel safety in those spaces. How important it is to be vulnerable with people who experience, have similar experiences to me. How important it is to let that guard down. And I'm still working on that, but just letting your guard down so you can fill your own cup how important community is within our work, sharing knowledge, sharing food and abundance and joy, very simple things that seemed inaccessible to me um, because I am trans, because I am brown, because I am neurodivergent, because I am someone with PTSD. Um, these are spaces we hope to create as black farmers. They are addressing issues at the root by creating access, by creating access to not only land, but um, a higher level of self-sufficiency um, to other community members, for anyone who wants to get involved in this work. And we deserve that much. It's only now that I am 27 years old um, and living in the United States that I'm beginning to heal and file through my path to notice the moments of community care work that did exist around me. Um, and I spent a lot of time pushing back against my relationship to Islam and believe there was no space for myself in that community, which is naive of me. Um, during the month of Ramadan, which many Muslims are currently observing, um, and you fast from sunrise to sunset, abstaining from food, abstaining from water, among other things. Um, I've learned how much of a meditative process that really is. It's a time to practice empathy for others and what they might not have, um, really simple things, and namely food. Um, but now I know food is also safety. Food is shelter, food is space to exist, space to commune, space to find joy space to share knowledge and faith. Um, I've always had this example of community centered around food, but I haven't had the opportunity to envision it. Um, back home, tents are set up every night during Ramadan across the city and feasts are prepared. Just huge, huge feasts that um, everyone is a part of. It's very dramatic, it's very opulent. Um, but the attention, intention is to share space across communities that don't typically share spaces. Um, it's a very, it's an extremely classist system in the United Arab Emirates, but it doesn't seem to exist during Ramadan. Um, and leftovers are then distributed through neighborhoods, families, and mosques. In hindsight, it is one of the only examples I had that highlights the work I aspire to do today. And I like to think that it directed me in this position now. Um, allowing myself to belong as a queer and trans Muslim black farmer, all which are labels that I've always been told do not fit with one another is what food justice is about to me. Um, finding that space where food and culture and identity intersect and can be celebrated. Finding harmony amongst communities to care for ourselves where a larger global patriarchal system tries to undo that work.
it is about freeing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Nar, for sharing your your story, your vision, your inspirations. Uh, it is so meaningful to have your voice uh, in the space and to be shared with uh, with so many others. Thank you so much. Um, we're receiving some excellent uh, questions um, from from Thomas and Ben. I think these are questions we'll definitely uh, bring to a larger discussion with all of our our panelists. Um, Curiosities about what are some of the crops that are grown at the Black Farmers Collective and where we sell them or where we share them. Um, uh, so that's definitely something we'll, we'll, we'll touch on. Um, how we connect uh, self healing and farming, uh, which in our shared um, uh, some excellent and amazing parts of, of their story. Um, as well as curiosity about some of the bureaucratic barriers to establishing uh, Black farms. Um, so we're, I think we'll have plenty of time to, to dive into these questions as, as a whole group um, uh, from our uh, many different uh, areas of backgrounds and experiences. So thank you um, uh, for uh, submitting those questions as well as I had a question from Detroit. So hey, shout out to Detroit who's joining us on, uh, on the line today as well. All right, um, so bringing it to our, our final uh, presenter, um, the uh, person who uh, we're really uh, excited to have as part of this conversation and bring into our, our work and sharing from the Black Farmers Collective. Um, I'll share my screen one last time here. And I will introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Price, a naturopathic physician. Um, Dr. Price's early studies involved an undergraduate degree in environmental microbiology and biochemistry in upstate New York. Her Master of Science research subject focused on bioremediation using soil bacterium and fungi. Um, this, fueled, uh, this was fueled by her interest in the power of natural therapies, including herbs and nutrition, and she entered a professional program at, uh, with my apologies if I mispronounce it, uh, Bastyr University. Um, in uh, 2005 to 2011, she earned a National Institute of Health Research Fellowship studying the effects of medicinal mushroom on innate immunity in breast cancer patients and those uh, unburdened with cancer. As an active clinician in the Puget Sound area, she specializes in culinary nutrition and immune support during cancer treatment. She's the author of three conventionally published books on contemporary cancer care during treatment to recovery and is a nationally recognized speaker on the topic. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Price to our conversation and discussion with the Black Farmers Collective. Hi everybody. Thanks for being here. I, I wanna thank uh, Shalay for um, in, uh, suggesting me to the Black Farmers Collective and for um, BF, uh, BFC for um, inviting me. And thank you Town Hall for your, your time and efforts in this. Welcome everybody and happy Earth Day. Happy Black Earth Day. Um, I wanna take you, you all on a little trip and, and I promise it's going to get to a point where you'll say, oh, okay, okay, it, this all makes sense to me. Um, I wanna um, echo out, thank you so much uh, for, for all the other speakers um, sharing really good information, uh, very much heart received as well. Um, so thank you. Um, so, so let's start. So. Um, Imagine yourself walking on a hike through the temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. Maybe you're in the Olympic rainforest. Um, perhaps it's in fall time. And you take a deep breath in and you smell that humid, wonderful soil smell that, that you, you can smell. Um, you smell the pines, the resinous, uh, um, the resin of the pines and um, the soil and the deciduous trees. And you, you look to your left and you look to your right and you look in front of you and particularly at the ground. And you see all over is our, our different shapes, sizes, um, uh, colors of mushrooms. They're all over the place. Um, can I get the first slide? Oh, I'm sorry, the second slide.
so that's that's kind of the picture that I'm I'm imagining. You're just looking all over and you're thinking, wow, those so there's so many mushrooms. So so those mushrooms are actually the the fruiting bodies of a large the, um, of a uh, of of mycelium, and mycelium is fungi are the largest organisms um, basically in the world. The largest that we know of is uh, three miles in diameter. It sits on the top of a um, in the top of a Oregon Oregon mountain, and the the fruit and bodies are the sexual part or the reproductive part, and the mycelium are the is the biomass that that runs um, that runs all along. Can we get go to the second slide? So so mycelium, the actual biomass. Um, are, these organisms are essential to soil and force health. And in fact, they form a vital communicate, they form vital communication networks between themselves um, miles away. And they also as, assist species to species communication, such as amongst tree species, as well as um, of fungal species, and they support their health. The base of all of these communications and other functions are nutrient molecules. If these nutrients are not present, their interface with the soil ecosystem and the community around is much, much different and it's much poorer. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? So just to review that the, in the fungal world, um, the largest organism on the planet is a fungi. It's uh, on the mountaintop in Oregon, and it's about three miles in diameter. Um, the biomass of fungi, um, or as in terms of mycelium, is extremely expansive, and that the fruiting bodies are the the, the reproductive parts, and the, they're the fruit, and they're the yummy. Well, some of them are yummy. Some of them are very poisonous, and they these. Uh, the, the mushrooms or the mycelium play an essential role in the degra in degradation and recycling of nutrients, and it supports a wide array of uh, of, of other organ uh, organisms in the ecosystem. Um, and fungi also play an extremely important role in communication. As I said before, it's almost like the 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 internet. I mean, that's the first worldwide internet, essentially. Um, but fungi also play an essential role in keeping, helping to keep the balance in this ecosystem and uh, uh, nutrient balance as well. Um, and also mushrooms and mycelium are often the indicator species of the health of the environment. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is where, uh, uh, so this is where the, the tie-in comes. We can learn, um, as uh, BIPOC folks, we can learn a lot from observing um, um, mycelium and, and also mushrooms. They can, can be, serve as our road, so, sort of a roadmap. So um, the first time I heard the, the term black mycelium was from a, a brilliant black farmer um, uh, and activist, Dean Jackson, um, Hilltop Urban Gardens. Um, and uh, uh, Dean is a very, a dear, dear friend of mine, and um, they are fantastic. Anyway, so so this idea of black mycelium is a is is using again mycelium and in, in observations of mycelium in in the environment as a guide and a roadmap to how we can be, and we'll talk about that in, in a second. But basically, um, forming black mycelium. Um, at forming an interconnected network of individuals who have the liberty to seek agency and joy necessitates living in an environment where we have access to nutrients that optimally support us. As Devon was saying is that, that you, in order for you to be, um, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but in order to, you, to be able to be free, to have agency, to access joy, you have to be able to interface or um, uh, interact with your environment in a clear in a clear way. And uh, nutrients nutrients are the things that are really important um, when we're we're talking about interfacing with our environment and, and others. 
So how do we nurture or continue to nurture this formation? This is where we can take some lessons from fungi. Can I have the next slide, please? So first of all, um, finding agency. So strengthening the individual without losing sight of the whole. So the point actually is self-actualization. So in other words, um, understanding how you fit in, um, in an individual basis. For example, um, there's, there's, a, 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 there's a video out there that starts from way out in, in outer space in the Milky Way, and it, and it comes down to the, uh, you know, into the planet Earth. And so it starts very large and it comes down to the individual. And then it, it, then it uh, gets extremely small to the smallest cell. And that's, that's what I, the point that I'm getting at is, is that, is that um, we have to know where we fit in and we have to be able to, um, to understand that and truly accept that to, to find agency. And, and to, in order to do that, here we come with that interface again. Um, for example, nutrients and, and, and gut biomes. Each of us have our own, and this is just an example, but of, 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 of individual agency. Each of us in nutrients, each of us have our own gut microsystems or gut ecosystems. And those gut ecosystems that are, that are unique, it's like a, 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 our own ecosystem. But those, those gut microbiome, those excuse me, gut organisms in our, in, our, in our ecosystems down there interact with our, um, our immune system. And they also interact with, with uh, you know, the cells um, and they are part of our, our, our mood. For example, our gut produces about 85 to 90% of our serotonin in, in our bodies. And so when our gut microbiomes aren't well, then our bodies aren't producing as much serotonin and serotonin will affect how we, we feel. You know, it's the, one of the feel good um, neurotransmitters. And so, so what does that mean? Well, if we're eating a diet, a, a standard American diet, that's highly of highly processed foods and packaged foods, then our gut biomes or our gut ecosystems are not going to be working very well. And there's going to be less um, uh, serotonin produced and we're gonna feel tired and we're gonna feel unmotivated and we're gonna probably feel pretty angry and depressed. And so, so whole foods diets are extremely important. So there's another reason to look to eating locally and look, look to eating seasonally from, from, from local farmers. Um, because most of the time, if you decide to do a whole, to eat a whole foods diet, um, eating from a gardens, eating, eating from local farmers, that's all there is. There, that's all there is, is whole foods. And these whole foods will supply soluble fibers, insoluble fibers that help our guts stay really nice and healthy. And therefore, in this example, make serotonin and um, also have a good serotonin to dopamine balance, supply vitamin D, which is another, uh, uh, well, everybody knows what vitamin D is, but it's also uh, recognized as a hormone that helps again with, with our moods, it's actually dopamine related. And also for women, um, uh, estrogen, estrogen levels, et cetera. So um, I also want, since we're talking about uh, uh, mushrooms here, this picture is a, a picture of uh, a, a mushroom um, called a truffle. And, um, and they're, they're, they're subterranean mushrooms. And so they kind of look you know, like you would never want to eat them. But uh, they're they're actually very delicious, and I wanted to use them as an example because, um, you know, our foods um, all they all have nutrients in them, and they're nutrients like antioxidants and polyphenols, etc. But our the whole foods also have chemicals or constituents in them that help us feel good and, f and interface with the world in a in 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 positive and beneficial ways. For example, truffles have a substance in them that, that reacts in a more mild way um, 
uh, if, like THC. So, so when we're incorporating mushrooms, when we're incorporating potentially uh, truffles or other things into our diets, this helps us interface in a more positive and a more uh, beneficial way, and therefore helps us to self-actualize, help, help, helps us to find agency. And, um, and when we're not nourishing ourselves, we tend to not know our places. We were a little more, bit more lost. Can I have the next slide, please? This, the, the second thing is, is tending to community. Um, mushrooms can help us understand this. The, the, the mushroom network, um, the mycelial network is so intricate, intricate and so um, massive that we can look to, to, to mushrooms to understand that we need to establish general networks. This is, this is a strength. And we also need to establish information networks. So sharing of information with each other is a positive benefit to um, the, the whole, the, the whole collective. Um, and then when we are healthy and when we are nurtured, we also can sustain um, resistance and also resilience. Um, when we're not, uh, uh, we're, we're not nurtured by uh, nutrients, we cannot, uh, uh, we can't continue adapting to, um, to stress. Um, and also we continue to diversify um, and, and, and innovate when we have nutrients. So uh, we evolve and, and mutate and, and, um, and uh, just keep, keep growing um, when we are nur nurtured and nourished. And, um, Establishing connections to land stewards that produce our food, um, uh, that's, that's very important because um, if, for many, very, very many reasons, but one of, one of the ones that I wanted to talk about is that, is that we are a throwaway um, society. Uh, we have learned to throw things things away that we don't need anymore. So we, we'll, we can go to the store and get a packaged, um, uh, uh, product and that's that has a, a you know um, you know maybe one piece of uh, you know plant based product in it and then the rest of it's plastic and cardboard and we we throw that away. Well, that ex that throwaway concept extends to um, people too. Um, if we can throw away um, 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 a, a, a f food or if we could throw away the, the, the packaging that food comes in, it is easier for us to throw away people and to, uh, to, to think that that, that, that is um, just a, a, an extension of, of what we've been taught. When we establish connections to land and to, our, to the farmers, to the food and where it comes from, and and what how much work it takes to 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 tend and to grow and to nurture, we are less likely to throw away food, and we're less likely to throw away people. Um, we are we are more thoughtful, and um, and like in nature, nature recycles and reuses everything so effectively and so efficiently. Um, can I get the next next slide, please? So, so we seek black joy in agency. So in summary, mushrooms and fungi can be a model for how to strengthen ourselves with the goal of joy and agency and health. Um, we, are, we are interconnected and absorb beneficial nutrients, which allow growth and expansion um, and beneficial evolution. Our growth um, and expansion is dependent on individual ecosystems, so the agency and the physical health of the whole or the, the community. Um, networks that support our growth are established with allies um, as for example, the mushrooms uh, are, or the mycelium are in, in associated with tree roots, um, et cetera. And communication and physical networks provide information and access to nutrient resources essential for health and joy. Um, allies work 
synergistically to support the whole. So our diversity and innovation is necessary for, for um, our survival. Resi resistance is a way to provide equity and balance, and this is necessary. And the last slide, please. Um, so happy, happy Earth Day. And um, thank you all for being here and for listening. And um, that's it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Price. Once again, from wherever you are, uh, give a hand clap of praise or snap your fingers or stretch, reach your hands in the air. Uh, if you've been sticking with us uh, for this presentation, thank you so much. Um, we're about to uh, segue into our portion. Where we're going to uh, pose some of the questions that you all have been putting into the chat. Uh, to our panelists, uh, as well as a couple of questions that uh, that I've kind of prepared and been working with to share with our, our panelists as well. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, you are uh, invited to and welcome to type in your questions. Uh, I believe there's also instructions on how you can text questions uh, if you're not uh, directly at a, um, a computer or tablet uh, to pose those to, uh, to our group. So for our panelists, as we uh, discussed before, um, I may pose a question directly to um, one of you if it came directly out of uh, something that you were presenting or, or speaking to, uh, or I might uh, pose it to the entire group. So um, I'll let you volunteer to jump in on a question uh, just by raising a hand or, or just you know, freely unmuting yourself and diving into the conversation. Um, so if we're all feeling ready to go, we can jump on in. Panelists, you feeling feeling good? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, well, I want to lead it off. Um, given that uh, today is is Earth Day, um, Earth Day is the fifty first Earth Day. Um, Start fifty one years ago. Um, the environmental justice movement uh, started just over ten years later. Uh, in 1982, from when Earth Day started, um, this is kind of like a multi a multi pronged question, and I'll invite our our panelists to to, to jump on any one of one any one part of these um, these questions or all three at the same time if you're feeling so inclined. Um, uh, kind of three part is like, how do you view uh, these two? Uh, how do you view these two milestones of environmentalism uh, from your perspective? Um, is there a difference in your eyes between the meetings and purpose of environmental justice and Earth Day? Um, and, and lastly, you know, um, uh, yeah, well, I think it's just like those, those two parts. So um, anybody feeling like they want to jump into that? Well, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, um, so Environmental justice and, and Earth Day. So Earth Day um, started around um, this, I guess, this awareness. Um, and I wouldn't say I wouldn't just say white awareness, but it 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 was kind of a white environmental uh, awareness or awakening of um, that we're polluting that we're polluting the planet, and it was more directed at um, the oceans and the effect on animals and um, environments and extinction, et cetera. Um, and, but it was not focused on, um, for example, cancer hotspots, which I'll, which I'll just say something about in a second. Um, so um, in, in that way, I think it was, a lot like the the women's suffragette suffragette movement, where uh, white women wanted the um, they wanted to vote, and so they got out in the streets. But uh, but who they left behind, who they didn't include, um, who they excluded, were black women um, um, from from that the right right to vote and and many other rights. And so I kind of, it's almost feels like the, almost the equivalent of that. Um, so, you know, about 10, what, uh, I guess 10 years, or so about 40 years ago, 40 or 
So Robert, Dr. Robert Bullard was one of the pioneers that said, hey, hold up, you know, we've identified these these cancer hotspots all along the Mississippi, and they just happen to be around, you know, BIPOC um, communities. And, um, and so, you know, out of that, out of the, here we go again with resistance, which is wonderful, you know, that we, that we do resist, but the unfortunate thing is, why do we have to, to resist? Why, why couldn't the environmental movement, the Earth Day or environmental movement also identify um, people being harmed in, in general, just people being harmed. So, so I think, um, you know, unfortunately, in some ways, the environmental justice movement has always been led by uh, BIPOC people because we're the ones that are affected and we are the ones that had not been um, um, getting resources from the larger white environmental groups at first that, that were celebrating, you know, Earth Day. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Price, for, for leading us off on, on, on that uh, contrast between environmentalism and environmental justice. Uh, as, as anybody's been you know, engaged in uh, conversations uh, this week or the past month or any part of farming, right, I've, I've heard you know, consistently, like, really, there's no, um, uh, you can't have a successful environmentalism movement without environmental justice. Uh, this is so important. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, is anybody else feeling uh, like they want to uh, chime in on any part of that question? I've got plenty of questions, uh, thanks to our audience as well as some of my own curiosity. So I've got lots ready, ready and ready to go. I'm happy to jump in real quick. I think, you know, like Lisa Price or Lisa hit the nail on the head. And like one other thing I want to add is just that idea of like the way that we celebrate Earth Day nowadays can be very exploitative and based on like consumerism and like buying products and sort of appreciating nature instead of thinking about our reciprocal relationship with nature and and this idea that like nature is separate from humans can be so dangerous when we're thinking about how we're going to move forward in in climate and just taking care of our environment and if we were able to take the lead of you know or look to black and indigenous folks who have been stewarding this land and taking care of it for so many generations, we would see that it's about a reciprocal relationship and making sure that we're not exploiting the land and looking at it as a whole thing as that we're all part of it. So that's just what I have to add. Yeah, excellent addition. Thank you very much, um, Hannah. Uh, I want to roll into um, another question, given we're talking about aspects of we've, we've the general the big umbrella topic of environmentalism, very specifically environmental justice, uh, and the solution that we are all working in in different ways of uh, food justice, uh, and specifically the Black Farmers Collective is doing uh, with, with, with some Black uh, with some Black led urban farms as well as some um, more which you might say like traditional farm that we're doing out in. Um, uh, at Small Axe. Um, I'd invite the panelists to share, uh, or any one or two of the panelists to share, uh, how you view Black-led uh, farms to be, to lead transformative change um, for and within Black communities. Um, and I'll add just another wrinkle. Um, I'll invite Nar. Uh, one of the questions from the audience was, how do you connect self-healing in farming? Um, so, yeah. Um, what are your what are your visions for um, for that transformational change that we see in the community um, connecting that to our work? Okay, I'm, I can speak to the self healing. Um, it's definitely access to nature in itself. It is healing. Access to nature. Access to being outdoors. Access to touching plants. Touching soil. Um, it, it almost seems like a foreign subject until you're in it and you're farming um, and you're really surprised by what you're able to do. Um, there's a lot of alchemy in the land um, and there's a lot of pride that comes with it. And 
it's never something you do alone and you always share. So I think the healing just kind of comes naturally with all of those things. Um, and then to answer the other question is having an example of other black farmers uh, doing this work, uh, finding spaces to commune, finding spaces to share their knowledge and their skill sets. Um, that in that in itself is healing. Um, and it all kind of just keeps adding up and piling in on top of itself. Um, I don't know if that all makes sense, but the healing work comes naturally. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nar. Um, I, I captured a couple of things that, that you were sharing during your presentation. Um, um, is long lines of, you know, I'm not quoting directly, but we are creating uh, safety for people in this movement that may not feel it elsewhere. Um, by creating access to land, we're also creating higher access to self-sustaining community care work. Um, I've been fortunate to be in the spaces you know, here at Yes Farm in the city, as well as going out to small acts and other kind of uh, access to farming that I've been involved in. Um, there is a, I, I feel a connection uh, to to working the land, to being in communication with uh, the things that are growing. Um, so I think it's a incredibly transformative and healing act of farming, um, as well as just the act of being black bodied and being in joy, being an act of, um, you know, uh, like against oppression. So just being and uh, is this great thing. So thank you, Nark, for sharing, for sharing those things. Those are definitely a product for me. Yeah, definitely. You just don't really have the opportunity to have those things. And once you start to see the opportunity and start to see the benefits, um, you, you stop and you think, hey, I can have all of those things as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nar. Uh, other panelists want to chime in on this conversation of what you see uh, as the transformative power of Black-led farming. Yeah, I think one thing for me for sure is like being able to to always be like learning from the plants and the environment and and from those plants I learn, oh, like this is how I can feed myself. This is how like my act of taking care of the land has taken care of myself as well, like in this whole process. And then when we bring more people into the space, like especially when we bring in youth, there's so much joy and being able to watch them like see a little bumblebee or a worm and just get so excited by it and then be able to just tell them like hey like you can grow your own food and you can become a farmer um which i think is a really different uh you know conversation than we hear sort of growing up about like careers or like you know what we're supposed to do or all these things it's like no you can create this on your own and then you know like i mentioned earlier um, with being especially an urban farm that's centered around like community I've just been able to build so many healthy relationships for people who like truly see me and who uplift my leadership and my voice and in turn like I get to get to know them and bring them into space and teach and uh, show them what's possible so I think that's also a huge part of like the transformative um, part of farming, transformative part of healing. And I think, you know, going forward when we're thinking of food sovereignty, just we have so much power, um, especially as black people to, to farm and like be liberated. Um, when right now we are in a world where like often when we're in spaces, that's not how we feel. We feel pretty powerless. So that's what it means to me. Thank you, Hannah. Um, now there's another question here uh, from uh, from the audience. There was, uh, looks like it was from, um, uh, I think it wasn't credited to a specific name, but um, they asked, uh, can you share some of the major bureaucratic barriers that there are to establishing black farms? Um, I, I, there's, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. It's got, you have to start with the history, right? Where, 
um, you know, many generations ago, there were, you know, black farmers held millions upon millions of acreages of land. And now the statistics from our own United States government say, you know, 95 to 99% of all land is held primarily by white land owners. So if it qualifies like as a bureaucratic thing, one of the biggest barriers for folks wanting to farm is, or who have the, like, the knowledge and skills is access to land to actually do that. Um, starting a farm is definitely, you know, very cost intensive and labor intensive. Um, and just being able to, to practice the kind of farm you want to do, you're off, if, you know, if you're starting out, you're often having to lease land. Um, there are, uh, there's different efforts um, in different parts of the country that are working with landowners and transferring farm uh, to new farmers, particularly black farmers. Um, so there's a, there's a stronger push going on right now um, that has been building for several years uh, through the work of lots of organizing um, to, to kind of overcome some of those barriers. But one of the ones that I'm uh, very well aware of is just access to land, period. Um, this is one of those big things. Um, any other our, our farm managers or folks with experience uh, want to share? I can jump in for a second. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like access to land is really crucial. And also like within our communities, like when we're experiencing so much policing and having the prison industrial complex in place that exploits the land itself and sort of recreates slavery, then we're like not able to actually participate in our communities and participate in stewarding the land. And we cannot build wealth to do those things and invest in the land and grow our own food and like have any sort of self-determination. And so that's why I always talk about abolition being like the main pathway towards our liberation because there's just without it, it's just not gonna work in the same way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Hannah. All right, um, let me continue on um, for a couple other questions. Let's select, um, I think just cause there might be just some curiosity. Um, what are we growing out there? <laughs> um, what are folks uh, enjoying uh, or prep, uh, preparing? I know it's um, springtime and there might be preparations for what's going on into the ground. Um, and that was a question that uh, folks had some curiosity about. Uh, maybe invite in um, uh, Devon, your voice, yeah. Yes. Well, last time I checked when we was at the farm, I know we just, uh, I know we just started planting some uh, some spinach, some cucumbers, some beans. Uh, I think we are growing a, a rhubarb, Swiss chard, uh, romaine. We planted mushrooms. Uh, I'm forgetting a couple other hundred other crops that we have. So sorry, <laughs> but. Um, so far, those are the ones that I could think of right now, and uh, a lot of the and a lot of that stuff is already ready to be harvested. So you can come down to Yes Farm and pick a couple, you know, pick a couple of things. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Don. Um, and I believe um, Hannah, correct me if I'm if I'm uh, mis misspeaking. Some of our food is going to some of the um, uh, mutual aid networks um, in the past in the past year. Um, uh, do you recall any of those uh, specific organizations that we've been sharing produce with um, or how folks can continue to support efforts uh, that are happening right here in Seattle and elsewhere? Yes, I can. Um, so the main place that we've been selling our produce to is Uprooted and Rising and COVID-19 Mutual Aid Group. And the main way that folks can support them is by donating and then also this Sunday, they're having a pantry. So if you're able to volunteer and drop off groceries, please go ahead and find their Instagram and Facebooks and sign up to drop off groceries um, or donate so that folks can buy groceries and deliver them to folks. Um, so check that out. And then also I do want to plug also Clean Greens Farm and Market. We were able to get produce out to them for their CSA giveaway as well. And they're also a Black 
led farm and market. Um, so really important to support them. And then in the future, um, and we've worked with them a little bit, we've also been working with Feed the People and that's also a great organization that's been feeding folks every week free food um, Thursday through Saturday, I believe. So, and it's really good. So um, those are the main organizations and we'll continue to partner with other folks as well. Awesome, thank you, Hannah. Um, now, uh, Dr. Price, I want to uh, call in your voice. Uh, there's some questions that came from the audience and that echoed some of the questions that I had as well. Um, uh, one of the first questions I asked actually is, well, who is the artist in the third slide that you have, the Mycelial Network? That's a beautiful picture. I'd love to find that artist um, and support them. Uh, but more specifically, um, when you're bringing in the description of like the Black Mycelium, uh, as we see our work here at the Black Farmers Collective being uh, deeply rooted in uh, food sovereignty and food justice, um, trying to make transformative change in the food systems uh, for Black health and liberation and joy. Um, I was curious, what, what are some of the different um, nutrients or impediments uh, that you see, um, uh, or actually all, all the panelists uh, through your work with the community um, that really create this a really strong, robust network for the Black community, not just for um, nutrient health, but also for you know, the health of our, uh, our actual community and our networks that we have there. I was wondering if you wanted to uh, explore that a little bit. So, so you're asking what are the important nutrients for, um, for health? Is that what you're asking? Uh, more, more like in, a, in an abstract way um, in terms of what we see in the food, uh, the food um, uh, sovereignty movement, right? Where um, Devon was speaking about food deserts, you know, um, what it, like our actual mycelial network in the black community uh, mm -hmm. as it relates to the, the inputs and the barriers, the, the gaps and how we really uh, ensure we have folks living in healthy spaces so that they mm -hmm. actually get and find able actually. to be. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, um, it's access to resources, right? Um, and um, I, I'm, I, you know, um, the green, green growth, um, and y'all can con correct me if I'm in, in, incorrect or if I'm uh, not completely correct. Um, but one of uh, the organic gardening um, boom and, um, and a lot of the tools that we know of came out of uh, Cuba, right? So Cuba, there were a bunch of sanctions, a bunch of embargoes that were happening. And so they became very, very isolated and they didn't have a lot of, of resources. So, so they had to turn to, to mo many, many people within the community f farming. And so, and they didn't have the pesticides, thank goodness, um, but they didn't have the pesticides. And, and also they, uh, in, in Cuba, there's a, a, a deep um, appreciation for and belief in, in green medicine as well. So you had this, this um, in, in po these imposed sanctions and pressure um, caused the resistance to to manifest in in growing organic and and also reliance on green medicine. Even now, in in um, the uh, clinics in in Cuba, there there the use of uh, herbal therapies is 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 a real big one and they're very open to that. So, so I think it's, it's, um, so we have these tools and, and we also have now these communities in Detroit, communities in Oakland, communities in the Pacific Northwest, which um, I mean, wow, it's really, you know, especially on the East Coast uh, is really expanding, exploding of, of folks that don't have or haven't had the traditional access to large plots of land, now, now, uh, and I gave the example of Hug, but you know, now I could give the example of Yes Farms and Brown Egg Farms, um, of 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 showing people how to grow, to growing, and then also making it it, it accessible, and um, and really, you know, as Devon was saying. Um, the standard American diets are diets that are not 
um, that, 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 that do not promote health in a correct interface with, with others in our environment or the environment. And, um, and when we're tired and we're not in right, right thinking space, um, we, we, don't, we don't make the best choices, um, the healthy, healthiest choices. And so, um, I, you know, I think access to, to resources, access to information, um, seeing other people that, that look like us doing, doing it um, um, are all things that I think interfere with us delving in. We sure are a diverse people. We are a diverse group of people. We don't, we can't pigeonhole ourselves into, you know, um, um, you know, this is what it means to be um, a, a black human being or African of African descent human being because we are broad, we are everywhere um, and we are diverse and we adapt and we resist in lots of different and innovative ways. I, almost, I think- mm -hmm. I almost made it through the presentation without talking while muted. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Price. Um, so so well stated uh, in the connections from our our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean uh, to all corners of uh, the United States here that we're in. Um, we're approaching the end of our time this evening, and there's there's still a handful a uh, handful of questions that are out there. Uh, some that you know we won't. Uh, have won't be able to uh, give uh, address the appropriate time for for such great questions, um, and I'd like to to wrap by by uh, posing one last question to our panelists. But I want to uh, put this question out there for for all members of the community who are on the call with us. Um, Keisha asks, "How do we see the work of building Black urban farming, food sovereignty, and Black land stewardship to be in conversation with Indigenous?" solidarity and land repatriation. Um, that is such an important question as we are doing this work for, for our own black liberation, our own food and sovereignty, that we recognize that uh, often we're doing this work on unceded land or land that's been stolen from people who are still here and fighting for, for justice. So those are important uh, questions to ask and conversations that we are um, uh, glad to be a part of here where we're working. Um, on, on land from uh, uh, and peoples of the Duwamish, uh, the Coast Salish and the Duwamish people specifically. Um, so excellent question. Unfortunately, we'll be able to dive really deeply into it today, but one that we uh, really take to heart uh, as we recognize um, uh, uh, the fight for justice against oppression. Um, it's not just one that's experienced by um, uh, Black folks. Um, but to, to end our time, uh, it's been such a fantastic uh, conversation um, to be in with all of you. Uh, maybe just go around, Robin, uh, given that joy is part of our um, mission and vision here at the Black Farmers Collective, if each one of our panelists just want to briefly share one part of farming uh, or food justice joy that you have, uh, whether it's you know, interaction with a pollinator or a favorite dish that you've made or uh, a favorite vegetable that you're really excited about putting into the ground uh, this year. Um, so I will uh, invite uh, Hannah to, uh, to share one piece of uh, joy in our closing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like one of the biggest joys is being able to uh, build community and bring my friends down to the farm. Like it just feels like I'm getting to hang out with people that I love very, very much. Um, and my favorite dish though, that I'm excited to cook is a big pot of soup with some squash and zucchini um, and some other good stuff in it. So that's what I'm excited about. Awesome. I'll pass on to Nair. Uh, my favorite activity on the farm is at the end of the season, saving seeds. Um, that brings me a lot of joy. Every seed is different. Every seed is held differently by each plant. Um, and yeah, it's definitely a time to talk about resilience and how we can sustain ourselves without, you know, a capital seed system um, and how one plant will become a hundred in the next year. And then the next year after that. Um, yeah, that brings me a lot of joy. Yeah. I'm going to pass it to Lisa Price. 
Well, um, so I'm, I'm not a farmer, um, but I am a forager. And so my joy is, is going into the forest and foraging for mushrooms, if you can imagine. And so my, my favorite, one of my favorite dishes is just simple, um, a, a, a chanterelle taco. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank and you. I passed to Devon. I have to say, um, <clears throat> my favorite part of the farm is when I meet new volunteers, they come down to Yes Farm for the first time and they look all around, they get really excited. They see the greenhouse, how we put the tarp up. They see all the crops that we're growing and everything. They look at the flower beds and stuff like that. And it's really nice to say that I actually contribute to each and every one of those parts. So it makes me feel better as a person. And just to kind of see the, the smiles and looks on their face, they get really excited when they come to this farm. It gets really special. I see out here, you know, so they see it, they love it. They start taking pictures. They go to the greenhouse with their friends. They're all taking selfies and everything like that. It's, it's really, really, really nice. I have to say my favorite plant on the farm is, is it has to be broccoli. It has to be broccoli. The broccoli is really good. I put it in the curry with a little bit of cayenne powder to kind of, you know, spice it up a little bit. That has to be my favorite vegetable. Uh, thank you very much, Devon, and to all of our presenters. Uh, one little piece of joy, definitely, is this evening spent with all of you uh, and the questions that we received. Um, but just a few weeks ago, as I was leaving Yes Farm, um, uh, Ray and Hannah picked a beautiful bouquet of mustard greens and collard greens uh, and be able to take those home fresh and had a delicious dinner and a breakfast to share with uh, with the loved one was very special. So uh, the joy that that came uh, and was shared from uh, land tended by uh, by black folks and shared with uh, with openness and joy. Um, so that um, concludes our evening uh, tonight with the Black Farmers Collective and the the, the voices that we shared here today. Uh, Want to give our thanks and appreciation, uh, of course, to our panelists, uh, but also to Town Hall Seattle for hosting this event with us. If you're looking to participate and um, join us at the Black Farmers Collective, feel free to visit our website blackfarmerscollective.org. Uh, if you're in the city of Seattle, uh, feel free to come by uh, Yes Farm on Saturdays between uh, 10 and 3 o'clock for some volunteer time. Uh, and definitely stay um, connected on social media to see what's happening and going on at Brown Egg Garden. Um, and maybe even in the future, some special events that we'll be hosting out at Small Axe, our four acre area up in Woodenville. So once again, thank you all so very much. And I'll hand it back over to our hosts at uh, Town Hall Seattle. Yeah, thank you so much, Cameron. Um, I just want to thank you all for uh, for speaking tonight. It's been really awesome hearing all your stories, and um, thanks for yeah bringing all of this awesome information to us and uh, all of your stories. It's been really great to listen to you. Um, and I want to just like communicate the the love and support in the chat that we're getting to just so you, yeah, I know you can't see it, but there's a lot of people here that are really excited to hear what you have to say and um, are really just uh, in, a, in a lot of support with you. Um, I want to thank the audience. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, I'm going to throw in the chat again here um, just the link to go and donate to the Black Farmers Collective. We want to encourage you to support them tonight. Um, great way to celebrate Black Earth Day. Um, Thank you all so much again, and I hope that you have a great night.